Well, ever since the hateful racist words of Reverend Jeremiah Wright finally saw the cold light of day for just a brief second, we've been talking about it on this program and on my radio program. We've also been talking about radical black liberation theology. I had never heard of it before. Well, you need to know about its aggressive anti-white foundation. This is hate speech, pure and simple. I feel that if a, if a potential president like Barack Obama was exposed to these beliefs, for over a 20-year period, and then supported it to the tune of one twenty-seven thousand five hundred dollar check. Said, "Here you go, Rev. Maybe we should understand it a bit." Seems Barack puts his money where his mouth isn't. I'm not sure. Joining me now is Anthony B. Bradley. He is a research fellow at the Action Institute and assistant professor of theology at Covenant Theological Seminaries in St. Louis. Um, Anthony, I asked you to write a series of essays for me, um, three essays. Um, to be able to help understand what this theology is, because I, I didn't, I'd never heard of it before. And I've read all three of them, and they're going out in the newsletter this week, and I think we can boil it down, so maybe you can hit on these three things here quickly. First, it reduces all, um, all problems of the world to the white man, right or wrong. Well, one of the things that happens in, in black liberation theology is that it actually reduces all sin to white racism. It's almost as if Adam and Eve fell in the garden, they sinned, and then we leapfrog to white supremacy. So the starting point is always white racism, and that's exactly what you saw in, and heard in Jeremiah Wright's uh, anti-Clinton rant that we heard uh, 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 a couple weeks ago. Okay. Now, we haven't heard this from anybody in the Obama camp. I've never heard him say anything that I, I thought was racist. I mean, I thought he said some things that, you know, white people wouldn't get away with, um, you know, about being the typical white person, et cetera, et cetera, but I don't care. I've got a life. Um, the uh, 1960s, however, we have heard some of this rhetoric spill out of his mouth. You say point number two is that it's all about black victimhood um, and ignoring progress. His wife said... Uh, you know, I've never been proud of the United States. I can't believe that it's taken this long for us to make it and uh, poor us, blah, blah, blah. Instead of saying, look at what we've accomplished. Exactly. Uh, sadly, many of these black liberation theologians are stuck in the 1960s. Uh, and, this, and this naturally leads into this idea that blacks are perpetually victims and that they're always being victims of white supremacy. And it completely ignores all of the evidence that points to, the, 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 to progress in the black community. You can look at Atlanta, for example, and see scores and scores of, of millionaires who are African Americans. All right, and the third point, I guess, is, is Marxism and redistribution of uh, wealth. And I would assume reparations uh, fall into this category? Well, one of the things that happens also is that Marxism is seen as a vehicle to bring about justice. And we also know that that is nothing but government forced uh, wealth redistribution uh, at the hands of people who didn't earn the wealth. And so uh, we're, 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 we're trying to, uh, to, to find a way to wrap this up. Okay. Anthony, thank you so much. Now, a reminder. He has been writing an exclusive series on black liberation theology for my free email newsletter. Tomorrow's edition focuses on how black liberation is really Marxist liberation. Plus, what does the church at Barack Obama that has attended for 20 years really preach? Find out in tomorrow's newsletter. Sign up right now.